Good morning, all. It's a pleasure to be with you here on this lovely Sunday morning. As you can see, uh, as was true with our prayer service on Wednesday, I am still here in Grace's office until such a time as my computer is returned to me. So I'm going to apologize in advance with that in mind for any technical uh, snafus that may happen over the course of this service. Uh, though she has a much better computer than me, it is a different computer than I'm used to using. And occasionally it seems that it does not like some of the ways that I use the streaming service that we both use to make this um, service broadcast to you all. But hopefully it will behave for us. But if there's anything going on, I have two or three screens here so that I can see uh, the service as it's being broadcast. So if we drop uh, the broadcast like we did on Wednesday with the prayer service, I should find out much quicker than I did then. Uh, I managed to get some of my screens together to make sure that that would work. But with that being said, we have our usual service today. We will be talking about the book of Jonah, specifically its final uh, chapter in which God and Jonah have a bit of a tiff over whether or not uh, God has done right. And we will look at all that that can tell us. But I have a few announcements first. We are continuing tomorrow our Bible study on uh, different topics which were chosen. Tomorrow is uh, how culture and the Bible impact the ways that we perceive uh, gender, specifically male-female relations, and whether or not it's more of a biblical thing, more of a cultural thing, and what the different perspectives are and how that impacts us. Um, so it's a very interesting topic, a lot to talk about with it, but we will be continuing that tomorrow. Um, beyond that, uh, you can expect that we will continue to update our charge directory. I've gotten plenty of responses and a few after I sent out the first draft, either edits that I need to make or just some more information to put in. So we will continue to expand our charge directory. Uh, again, the charge directory is meant so that we can stay connected across our three churches and that we never have a moment where uh, we are unable to reach someone who we know is sick, but would and we'd like to send them some sort of condolences or something like that, some sort of get well wishes, let them know that we're praying for them. And so the charge directory, which is completely volitional, helps us with that. Um, of course, if you are someone who doesn't want to participate in that, you don't have to. Um, but if you do and you have not yet sent me your information, please do. That way I can also make sure it's updated in our other directories. Um, hopefully we can create a system so that we update that a bit more regularly and we're looking at ways that we can digitize the information so that we can just update it and it'd be available through some sort of login or something like that. But that's a bit of a process and making sure that it's done in a secure server is important, um, even with something you know as simple as uh, address and stuff like that, which you can usually look up. We like to protect people's information. So if any shift like that happens, it will come after a thorough look and uh, looking into the different options and then discussing it with the churches. But for now, we're going to keep it in our usual way, which is to say Word documents we generate ourselves and keep within our network. So that will be perfectly fine in that. Um, outside of those two things, our charge directory and our Bible study, the only thing that I have to say um, is just a reminder as we start the new year in terms of the ways that we are able to tithe. I know we went back into our in-person meetings and then went out. But just a reminder that you can give either through um, mailing into your respective church's uh, treasurer. Um, that information is sent out in our email every week. But if you need that again, please let me know so that I can get you the information to be sent out to you so that you can send in uh, whatever you would like to give to the church. Or you can go to our website, uh, www.sju-umc. Dot org, and there is a module in order to give there. Um, but just as we start the new year and going back online in December like we did, a reminder that you can still give if you'd like to uh, while we were out of the churches. We got used to giving again, uh, at least in some places in person. So that's a way that you can do that. But with all that being said, I think it's well and good in time that we jump into our service for the day. So as usual, we will be going through, and if anything is in bold, say it along with me. If it is not in bold, then I will simply proclaim it out for us to hear. So let us now begin our service. Please join me in our affirmation of mission. Our mission is to live and share the gospel of Jesus Christ 
to disciple others with love and forgiveness, and to look to God for spiritual guidance. Amen. What a great mercy you have for us, Lord God of heaven. When we have condemned ourselves, you still show mercy, and when we condemn our enemies, you show us our folly through displays of mercy we cannot begin to comprehend. The mystery of your perfect judgment is revealed in your perfect mercy. So reveal your ways to us today. Amen. And now would you please join me in our collect. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior Jesus Christ and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation that we and the whole world may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our opening hymn for this morning will be Depth of Mercy. Would you please join me in this hymn? Amen. Today, we are looking at, with our footnotes, one of the things that's going to come up with our uh, scripture for today. So there is this phenomenon that we see a lot in Hebrew Bible and a little less in the New Testament of this very kind of, oh, how shall I say, confusing aspect of a God who is, as we usually term it, omnipotent, that is, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, and omnibenevolent, all-good, who sometimes does things that seem to go against that. Um, and today we're looking specifically at a passage that talks about God's omniscience, God knowing everything. Because our scripture today contains one of the most notable instances in which scripture tells us God changed God's mind. Throughout the Hebrew scriptures, there are various instances where God is described as changing God's mind. Um, sometimes expressed in those words, but other times described as an act of repentance on God's part, or even regret. Um, and it leads us to the question, how can God, who created all things and know all things, change a single thing about their perspective on the creation they made? While our sermon will tackle how we can understand God's ability to change, um, I want to be clear before we begin that if you read through the Hebrew Bible, if you read through the Old Testament, you will not see any attempt to reconcile that. God is presented as all-powerful, as all-knowing, but also as a personality that can have opinions about the world, some of which cause God to change God's mind. 
God shifts the promise made to Abraham several times to account for Abraham's decisions up to that point. God is dynamic. God is on the move. For us on earth, we can never be fully aware, fully understanding of why God is seemingly able to change. Viewpoints on such hugely important things. But the way that scripture describes it should give us hope. Hope of a God who is working towards more and more mercy for God's beloved creation. And so let's keep that in mind as we look at God actively changing a plan. Let us understand a bit more the ways in which God works. So we're going to jump into our scripture now. It is from Jonah chapter 3. Um, hear these words from the scripture. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our preparatory hymn this morning is going to be Just As I Am Without One Plea. Let us come together now and sing this hymn.
So Jonah is a gold mine of strange and fascinating instances of God's mercy and of human selfishness. Nineveh, the city which Jonah is called to preach to, was also the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Within a handful of generations, the empire would rise up and destroy Jonah's kingdom of Israel and reduce it to little more than a relic of what it once was, turning its sister kingdom of Judah into a vassal state. The Assyrians, unlike their Babylonian counterparts, were not interested in maintaining any semblance of normalcy in their conquered kingdoms. Once a nation fell to Assyria, a large chunk of the native population was transported elsewhere in the empire and replaced with another group from another conquered territory. While Babylonians exiled dignitaries to help with administration, the Assyrians exiled thousands to stamp out resistance and to stamp out cultural identity from their conquered territories. Assyria was ruthless, and yet somehow it became a place that, we're told, God was willing to work salvation. As we have discussed previously, when looking at the book of Jonah, the book itself is a historical fable. While Jonah was a real prophet active in Israel, the exact events of the book are a narrative which provides a clear example of the sort of work he engaged in. The comparison between it, the book of Jonah, and George Washington's a uh, cherry tree story that we tell remains apt. The story is not a one-to-one -one history of an event, but it's meant to tell us something about the characters in the story. In this case, the characters are God and Jonah. Jonah, the stand-in for all of humanity, is an unwilling prophet. He's not unwilling because of fear, but out of hatred. God is sending to Jonah to preach repentance to the people who Jonah knows will destroy his people, that the audience of the story knows will succeed in wiping them out. Jonah wants God to destroy the Assyrians, and Jonah believes that if he can get out of preaching repentance to them, that God will be trapped in God's own desire to see justice done. Jonah, like so many before him and like we do today, was trying to trick God into doing what Jonah wanted. Yet the whole arc of the story shows Jonah being pushed to Nineveh even despite his opposition. When Jonah tries to escape God's call on his life by ship, storms prevent him. When the storm blocks one path, Jonah seeks to drown himself to avoid his call. But a great fish comes and prevents his escape once again. Somewhere in the despair of the ocean, Jonah comes to terms with what God has given him, not for the reasons we would want him to. He takes up his call, he goes and preaches to the city, and then camps out on a hill nearby, because Jonah is sure that the city will carry on being evil, and that the city will be destroyed in short order. Jonah, the prophet who heard the voice of God, had failed to listen to the city he was preaching to. We are told that Jonah made it at least a day's journey into the city, a city that was three days' journey across. Though the story does not tell us whether he carried on through the city or not, it seems likely that Jonah stopped traversing the city at this point. The half-hearted, spiteful prophet was not willing to give any more time to these people he actively wished to be destroyed. Even as he walked back out of the city, he began planning how he would watch it burn. Even as he left the gates, he failed to hear the decree of the king calling the people to repentance. You see, Jonah, like we do, was sure that God would only speak against the people of Nineveh if they were truly beyond repair. We see in something we dislike or that we, don't, or that we know to be bad an insurmountable obstacle to reconciliation and recovery. God, thankfully, is more creative than we are. God, in relenting, in changing God's mind, is ready to take something like Nineveh and give it a new lease on life. Because God knows there is power in grace and forgiveness, power that is greater even than the most wrathful anger of the divine. Throughout scripture, God is described as repenting and relenting of wrath. When judgment comes to a people, God can and does remove the penalty of that judgment. 
These are treated the same way that a person may forgive another person, albeit often on a grander scale. The language of relent, as is used to describe God in this passage, can be translated as consoling oneself or being sorry. It is the same language used for when God regretted making humanity before the flood. The king of Nineveh in his prayer is essentially saying, if we repent of our evil, perhaps God's heart will soften and God too will repent, not of evil, but of anger. Repentance, turning around, changing direction, would here suggest that God is not only ceasing to do harm, but even blessing the people who have repented of their sin. The people who were once completely against God, now they had a chance to go even beyond simply avoiding what is bad, but stepping into the goodness of God. The people of Nineveh were not just being spared, they were being saved from themselves. Fasting, covering themselves in sackcloth, they were all outward signs of an inward change. God set out to destroy Nineveh. Nineveh saw the coming wrath and turned around. God likewise transformed punishment into opportunity. The people had a chance for real change, for a relationship with the God of the universe. The paradox of Jonah is that God sets out to destroy Nineveh. But God also sends Jonah to save the city through his preaching. The prophet sees the intent of God's actions immediately. God is loading the deck against the destruction of the city. God is actively working to make sure that the availability for mercy overcomes the need for judgment. God wants to be convinced the city is worth sparing. More than anything, God wants to change God's own mind about the necessity of violence against creation. God desires that not even a single soul should perish, but that all people might be saved. When we begin considering God's righteousness and judgment and God's righteousness in offering mercy, we inevitably get a headache. It seems on one hand that for God to be absolutely merciful, God must give a blanket pardon to all people on earth, thus showing the absolute power of mercy. Likewise, our mind looks at all the evil of the world, and we say to ourselves that God would be equally justified in destroying much, if not all, of humanity. Life is rough, and oftentimes we find ourselves overwhelmed by both the need for forgiveness to manifest and for justice to burn. I personally do not envy God in looking at the world. To see in every person the best and worst of humanity and then have to balance intention, wrath, and mercy, and in all things show incredible love for all things. There are times I don't even know how I feel about people in my own life, unable to discern them as mostly good or mostly bad in how they interact with the world. I could not do this with seemingly infinite numbers of people throughout history. Yet God looks at humanity and loves it eternally. Yet God chose the ultimate expression of mercy in giving the Son, a member of the eternal triune divine, to live a life we may model and die a death that sets us all free. Ultimately, the paradox of God in Jonah in all of history, in all matters of mercy and judgment, is that God is not the binary switch we imagine God to be. God is not at one moment a burning cloud of anger, and then the next a gentle breath of peace. God is simply God. The eternal being who manifests in our life as blessing, as goodness, as love. There reaches a point in trying to understand how God acts in history where no words are sufficient. No wonder that the Hebrew scripture often stops short of trying to explain God's inner thoughts. We know God seems angry in one moment but may offer peace instead of judgment when the time comes. God, for love of us all, seems to be able to change God's mind. That is sufficient to know. If we know that God is ultimately or oriented towards mercy, and if God is even willing to see the worst humanity has to offer into the kingdom of God, then we too must define ourselves by mercy. We are too quick to write people off, too ready to wish ill of our enemies, 
too poised to see God wipe out those we have imagined are not part of the world we inhabit. For Jonah, this meant first running away from his call to save hundreds of thousands of people, then giving up partway doing his work. That the book concludes with God chastising him for his hardness of heart should not surprise us. Let us be enthusiastic in our quest to be merciful. When the opportunity comes to get to know those we have written off comes, let us take it up with a smile and with hope about what that chance might bring. When we find ourselves wishing evil on other people, let us remember God sparing Nineveh and let go of that anger. When we went to give up partway through the difficult walk towards reconciliation, let us do what let us outdo Jonah and make it to the end of our work before we decide whether or not the trip was worth it. Love is the greatest mystery we are shown in life. Mercy is love which we show one another when times get hard. That God's mercy is baffling to us should not be surprising. Yet it offers us the example of how conflicted we can feel. Anger, disappointment, regret, all these valid feelings that can come out of conflict that we have with one another. However, they should not overcome our faculties for mercy, for peace, and for love. Repentance is hard. Working with people who just don't get it yet is hard. The whole business of living a good life can be overwhelming. Thanks be to God that in his work at Nineveh and on the cross and in our own lives, we are continually shown it is all possible. Changing hearts and minds, that is the business of God. And sometimes it seems that business can be turned inward. Let us work to change our own minds and to seek peace with all those around us. Amen. Amen. We now come to the part of our service where we offer up prayer for one another. As our usual course of action, I will pray out our general prayer of petition, then we will go silent for a bit, and then after a minute or two of sharing in the comments, we will come together and pray through our particular petitions. So would you please now join me in our general prayer of petition? Lord, we cannot fully understand the ways in which you show us mercy. Through your prophets long ago, you showed your people your plans to redeem them. Through your Son, that plan was fulfilled. Now place within all of us the same desire to see the world redeemed as we live, as we lift one another up in prayer. Amen. Please put in the comments any prayer request you have today.
Please continue to share as we begin our petitions this morning. Together let us pray for the people of this congregation. Those of us, Lord, who are disheartened, who have lost motivation, who have lost direction. Those of us who feel isolated. Those of us who are mourning the loss of loved ones. Lord, you know more than anyone what each and every one of us feel. Perhaps better than ourselves, you know what is striking our hearts. So reach out to your people. Extend a hand to us. And whatever our problems are, take them up. Deliver us from them. But even if the problem itself does not uh, disappear, we can know how to respond to it and find somehow joy in the life you have given us. Lord, may strength and courage, faith and love define us all as we pray for all those around us, for these, the people of our congregations. Together, let us pray for those who suffer and those in trouble. We as a people, we as humanity, are limited in scope, limited in sight, and limited in how much we can take. Show mercy to your people, Lord, as you showed us before in Nineveh, as you showed us upon the cross, that our suffering is not in vain and that we may overcome it somehow. Open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out mercy upon mercy. Remove the obstacles, remove the pain, remove all that stands in our way of truly being able to feel and understand the love and the gifts which you have given us. Lord, come and be among us. Come and deliver us as we pray for all those who suffer and all those who are in trouble. Together, let us pray for the concerns of our local communities. Lord, we continue to pray for the unhoused, that they may have shelter. We pray for the schools, for the teachers, for all who work within the schools. Lunch staff, custodians, school bus drivers, all other administration that we cannot even begin to think about. And we ask that you protect them. That as on-site learning begins again, they may find a bulwark placed against this virus. And that people can continue to be educated, to teach, to lead safely. Lord, show us where in our community there are needs and how we can meet them. Either through partnering with existing ministries and services or finding our own way through life to give mercy and life to all who we meet. Whatever it may be, Lord, let us be lifted up as servants ready to do the good work of your kingdom as we pray for these, the concerns of our local community.
Together, let us pray for the world, its peoples, and its leaders. Lord, continue to bless the world you have created. May all those who are in leadership positions in government throughout the world be given wisdom and understanding to follow your will and not their own. Show them how they can serve their citizens well. And show each of us as citizens, not only of our own nation, but of the world, what we ought to do to extend love to one another, to work actively, to bring about your kingdom, not only here or there, but across all the earth. Unite us with the bonds of your spirit and show us the way in which we can truly help one another. Lord, let us continue to push back against this pandemic, the virus that has pressed so hard against us. Let the vaccines continue to be efficacious. Let them continue to beat back various variants of this virus. And may each and every one of us, as soon as we are able, find ourselves easily within reach of the vaccine. That again, Lord, we pray continues to be effective as the virus mutates and changes, as all viruses do. Lord, please think of your creation as we pray for the world, its peoples, and its leaders. Together, let us pray for the Church Universal, its leaders, its members, and its mission. May all churches be blessed, Lord, with the visitation of your Spirit, which leads us. May we all know what we are to do and when we are to do it. Bless leadership to make the decisions we ought to make, not the ones we would like to make. And show us each and every one of us as a nation of priests called by your name to know that God's work is never relegated to any one type of person, any class, any race. There is no separation in the kingdom of God, although we try sometimes to impose it. Lord, come to your people and tell them what they are to do, what we as a body are to do and what we as individuals ought to do that we, unlike Jonah, would not run from our call, but embrace it and do all that we can to see it done faithfully. Lord, hear our prayers as we pray for the church, its leaders, its members, and its mission. We pray all these things together with the saints. Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Before we go to our prayer of thanksgiving, I want to make one more announcement that I forgot about until we were praying about it, which is to say, uh, last week I promised that I would be compiling a uh, resource list so that we could know as a charge a bit more about when and how uh, people qualify for the vaccine as it's made available. I have not forgotten this. Um, I am putting that together. Unfortunately, last week was the week of everything breaking. First my computer, then both our cars. The cars are getting fixed, one completely now and the other tomorrow. Um, 
and the laptop is on its way back. But I will be compiling that list of resources hopefully today so that that can get out to everyone um, and we can traverse the uh, DHHR site a bit more clearly because to just sit down and read it, it, it comes across a bit like uh, it's in a different language from time to time. But many of us in the charge now qualify for the vaccine. And so for those of us who are able, it's good for us to begin the process of getting it because the sooner we get it, hopefully the sooner things will get back to normal. But that resource list will be put out sometime this week uh, once I cross-check it with the uh, DHHR and the coronavirus hotline um, here in the state of West Virginia. But I wanted to say that um, because it's something that I neglected to say at the beginning of the service. But now let us come together and give thanks. Anything today that you are thankful that God has given you, just drop it in the comments that we may lift it up in prayer. And I'll begin us with this sharing by saying that, believe it or not, tomorrow marks one year that Grace and I have been married. It was one year ago tomorrow that we went down to Buchanan and said our vows to one another. Um, this year seems like it is the shortest year that we could have ever lived, our first year of marriage, and also one of the longest, because pandemics are weird. Um, but it has been a wonderful year, and I am so thankful to have such a wonderful person to share my life with. Um, but I will begin our time of Thanksgiving by saying that, believe it or not, tomorrow is my anniversary with Grace. So that is my Thanksgiving. Um, please share anything you are thankful for this morning here in the comments. Thank you all for your warm congratulations, and now let us join together in our prayer of thanksgiving. Savior of the world, we praise you for the deliverance we experience every day. You have delivered us from sin and death, from hell and from our own depravity. Now receive our thankful prayers and accept our humble love of your divinity. In all things, Lord, may we be made into you gracious people. Amen. And now we come to our closing hymn. Today it will be, Come We That Love the Lord. So let us join together now in this, our closing hymn.
Amen. One of my favorite hymns, although I called it uh, Let We Who Love the Lord, um, rather than its actual name, which is Marching to Zion. So I love that hymn so much that I forgot what it's called. In any case, uh, excuse the flicking on the screen there, uh, but we come now to the end of our service. So let us join together in our closing statement. Would you please say it along with me? May I love as God loved, live as Christ lived, and be filled with the Holy Spirit as I leave this place. Amen. And may all of you in your week think of God's mercy and be thankful that we are shown it so abundantly. But let us turn that thanksgiving into action and show mercy to those around us. Those who we would rather write off, those we'd rather be angry with, those we would rather throw to the side. Let us embrace them, let us love them, let us give them the chance which God once gave Nineveh. Because even if things go amiss after that, we can at least know that we did our part. Our part in reconciliation, our part in love, our part towards working to a future in which all of God's children can come together and love one another fully. So God bless and keep you today and always. And may I see you sooner rather than later, whether it be through Bible study, whether it be through our prayer service, or whether it be through a phone call that we have somewhere in the week. May God bless you this week. And may we see all of us once again very soon. God bless you all. Goodbye.